Microphone check. One, two, what is this? It's the five foot seven assassin in the podcast business. I am your host, Rohan Patra, the rap music plug at your service. The rap music plug podcast presented by QLC TV is the remedy to the I don't have anything good to listen to problem. This is your one stop shop to knowing what to add to your queue, play next, or pop into your record player. Welcome to the show. Are you a rap music fan? Are you someone who loves the feeling of discovering new music, but find it hard to navigate through the thousands and thousands of new albums that get released every single day? If any of this applies to you, this show is exactly what you need in your life. My absolute passion is music. So I gladly do the dirty work of virtual crate digging, searching for the next great album so that you don't have to. I am into all kinds of music bringing you fresh album and song reviews and inspired commentary on all that the mainstream and underground rap scene have to offer. If you're an artist who wants to get their album or song reviewed on the show, feel free to hit me up at qlctv.podcast at gmail.com or shoot me a DM via Instagram or Twitter at rohview where we can discuss a potential review on the show, potential collaboration ideas like coming on as a guest, Or even if you just want private feedback, I can do that as well. I would love to be a part of helping you grow as an artist. I live for this. Nothing makes me feel better than expressing my thoughts and feelings about music. But I've still got more on my mind than just music, so although the focus of the show is certainly rap, I will occasionally cover hot-button political issues from time to time. So that's enough compulsory podcast introduction. Let's get to the show. What is up, family? Welcome to episode 22 of the Rap Music Plug podcast, where I'll be discussing the impact of the great Rock Marciano with a review of his new project, Mount Marcy. We'll also be discussing if Wayne managed to recapture some of that mixtape Wayne magic on No Ceilings 3. And then finally, we debut the first installment of the Indie Spotlight series with a review of No One's Project Tripping. So let's start with Rock Marciano's Mount Marcy. Rock Marciano, hailing from Long Island, New York, is an absolute underground legend at this point. With countless great projects over the past decade, from Marsburg in 2010 to what we have here, Mount Marcy, in 2020. Rock is both an exceptional rapper and producer, who has been an absolute trailblazer for this new crop of artists like the Griselda Boys in Westside Gun, Benny and Conway, RJ Payne, Boldy James, and many others in that scene that bring street rap over dusty, minimalist, sample-heavy production that is not mainstream in the slightest. Rock's pioneering influence and impact didn't just end there, it also extended to how he marketed and sold his music. Much like a mock homie who I reviewed uh, the Mox Hard Lemonade project a little earlier this year, Rock similarly sold his music as it was real, true, fine art which was reflected in the price tag, as well as how it was sold, as Rock was one of the first artists in the game to really sell his albums through a direct-to-consumer model where he would have his albums available only by purchase for the first two, three weeks of the album's release, which is what he also did with this album, Mount Marcy. Rock is fresh off of 2019's amazing Marcielago project, which capped off an amazing run he had been on that was filled with lyrically impressive, creatively produced hip-hop projects that just oozed swagger, class, and real rawness. With Mount Marcy now, this album truly feels like Rock Marciano alone on the mountaintop, reflecting on a rap scene he was so instrumental in cultivating and popularizing. 
a rap scene that put aside traditional customs of needing prominent drums in the mix and instead brought a renewed focus to the atmosphere, the mood, and the samples being used in the production that allowed his revolutionary rapping style to breathe, which made Rock sound like he was just talking to you with effortless poetry and movie level imagery. If this album were to be Rock's last, which there's no signs it will be, it would still be a fitting send-off. The album's construction mirrors how he built his career, fully produced by Rock Marcion himself, with very little features, as Rock, as an artist, truly built his career from the ground up, with a remarkably singular approach that was self-sufficient and defied all conventional standards which led him to, and not Drake, or even a Kendrick Lamar, in my humble opinion, in my personal rap music world, define the 2010s. And I think many fans of, and artists in the underground scene would agree with me. All this being said, Rock still does enlist a bit of help on this project, with some co-production, really I think just two production credits going to Jake One on Downtown 81 and Chuck Strangers on the first half of Baby Powder, but otherwise there are just some very fantastic features too. Starting with COVID Cough with Schoolboy Q, who drops one of his rawest performances in years. And you can just see the respect that even a pretty damn mainstream artist like Schoolboy Q shows rock by dropping such an incredible verse he really sounded hungry as hell it really got me excited for a next uh, schoolboy q project but then there's also stove god cooks who released an album his debut fully produced by rock marciano earlier this year reasonable drought that was fantastic and he picks up right where he left off with great quotables delivered in such an emphatic and unique way that you really just have to hear to understand. He has some hilarious lines like, you should worry about some different shit honestly. Like why does Jesus peace look like Matthew McConaughey? Like damn, that just goes so hard. And then finally we have Cool Keith on Broadway Billy. And I found this to be a pretty interesting collaboration as Cool Keith actually brings rock into his world with a beat and hook that sounded straight out of a late 90s early 2000s cool keith track and it's nice to see cool keith an og get a look like this because cool keith is in a lot of ways a pioneer in his own right pioneering this really obscure ridiculousness in his lyrics that someone like rock marciano i'm sure was influenced by because they both possess a very similar absurdity and sexual ridiculousness in their lyrics. Rock does it more from a pimp's perspective, whereas Cool Keith came from more of a perverse perspective. But still, it's really nice to see him get a look like this and drop a really dope verse in 2020. And now moving on to the production. This album probably spotlights the lyrics the most out of any recent Rock Marciano project, as the beats rarely collide with the vocals, which is something that tended to happen quite a bit on Rock's previous work. So in a lot of ways, this album sounds like an updated version of 2010's Marsberg from a sonic perspective and from a perspective of how he raps and how his vocals are used, because Similar to Marsberg, these beats are very cold and bare bones at times, yet it still feels very much like Rock's more current style that he's adopted, uh, I would say very much after Rosebud's Revenge 1, which saw Rock start to really dig into incorporating even more hilarity, personality, and be even more offbeat. In the way he rhymes so it's more like a refined style of what he's currently been on for the last few years 
But to be clear, when I say the production is bare bones, it just means that it's very minimalist and not very dynamic or constantly changing. That doesn't mean anything negative. And I want to make that clear because I find there's such a disrespect when people call uh, this kind of music just rapping over loops. It's insulting to me. The intricacies in the mixing and the way the samples are cared for on this project, just like all the other Rock Marciano projects only come through with very attentive and multiple listens. These beats here on Mount Marcy are definitely dope, but they are much more understated and less attention grabbing than any of the previous Rock Marciano projects, basically since Marsburg in my opinion. Whereas the previous Marcialago project from last year had some of his most dynamic beats yet, with beat changes and a lot of variety throughout the album's sounds. And so that being said, like, I do prefer the more soulful sounding style that Rock particularly had on Rosebud's Revenge 2, which is, in my opinion, the best Rock Marciano project he's made, because I think the murderous tendencies, the pimp swag, was a great combination over the really lush soundscapes. It came off like pure gangster elegance and fit so well with Rock's persona. I think the cold, bare bones style was executed well, it's just not my personal preference for a Rock Marciano project. There were definitely still some highlights on this album, both in the rhymes and the production. I love the elegant closing track. That is a nice moment of brightness that takes the listener out of that previous cold and dark trench that I had been on over the previous 14 tracks. And there was also tracks like Wheat 40s that had a really nice, really nice sample, really nice head nodding beat. And Covid Cough, as I previously mentioned with Q, that had this really frantic beat that fits so well with their rhymes. There's also Butterfly Effect that had this silky smooth sax filled instrumental and Rock just waxing poetic with some his usual quotables. So, as a whole, I do think Mount Marcy is a good project. I really do. But I do think that it feels more like a refinement of already rehashed ideas and lacks a bit of the memorability of his previous projects. I think as a result of the fact that Rock has really solidified himself over these past few years as being a certified bona fide legend, I think he comes off a little less hungry. By no means is the rapping bad or even just pretty good. It's still very good top tier rapping with so much imagery, so much creative word choices and turns of phrase that only an artist like Rock Marciano can pull off. But I do think this album lacks a bit of the impact where I don't get the impression from all of these songs of rock at his best, which is creating an atmosphere that is all encompassing, that draws me in and makes me wait on bated breath, hanging on every single word of his. And it's for that reason that although I do really like this project, I do think it's another great effort by Rock Marciano, I still rank this lower than his previous work. And so I give this album by Rock Marciano, Mount Marcy, a 7.8 on 10. Definitely, if you're a Rock Marciano fan, this is an instant cop for you, no questions asked. If you're into the minimalist, dusty, underground sound that's really popping right now, this is a must listen as well. If you're a fan of more of the conventional style rap that's more mainstream, I say this album and this artist is just too good to ignore if you like music in general. I would say though, for accessibility reasons, that I would start with Marcia Lago or even 2012's Reloaded as your first starting points with Rock Marciano before getting in to this project, Mount Marcy. Overall, it's always worth it to give great artists a try, but I'd say make it a point to listen to this 
with attentive ears. Don't listen to this while you're multitasking, maybe at work or something, because especially out of all of the Rock Marciano projects, this one really requires you to listen to the lyrics and the, the songs are constructed as so to focus on the lyrics because there's not a lot going on when it comes to the instrumentals on this thing. Now we can move to this new Lil Wayne mixtape, No Ceilings 3. So Lil Wayne is a certified legend at this point. He's one of the biggest artists in rap ever, having sold a ton of records and being very famous uh, from a mainstream perspective. I've had a pretty complex uh, relationship with Wayne's music in that the New Orleans rapper has been a guy that I've always liked and sometimes loved. But I don't think he's ever put together one singular project that I've fully loved front to back and I could say is a classic. But that being said, he has a ton of classic songs, a ton of classic verses, and overall his talent is otherworldly. And the point in Wayne's career that universally people have always pointed to as being his peak is dubbed the mixtape Wayne era. And that era was from roughly 2005 to 2007, where Lil Wayne dropped so many tracks through these free mixtapes that at the time was very unprecedented for an artist of his caliber and of his popularity. But he dropped these projects on Datpiff and really revolutionized how artists distributed their music as Mixtapes existed and 50 Cent was also one of the artists that really popularized it. Wayne took this to another level, making it a point to jump on any beat, whether it's a beat that was produced for him or a beat that was produced for another artist and a song that was already released. He would jump on that beat and absolutely destroy it. With an infectious looseness found in the structure of these tapes, but most importantly, Wayne's effortless delivery. Crazy charisma, hilarious punchlines. Listen to tracks like They Still Like Me off Dedication 2 and you'll see exactly what I mean. So going into No Ceilings 3, this is a continuation of his acclaimed No Ceilings uh, 1 project, the first No Ceilings project, which was one of his best mixtapes. But at this point, Wayne is, in my opinion, 6, 7 eight, nine, nine years, I think, removed from really being a rapper that I was looking forward to listening to and expected great things. And that's unfortunate, but due to a lot of reasons, mainly substance abuse, as well as some label issues, he really hasn't dropped much that has been really dope over the past decade. But here we are, Wayne, over these past couple years, has had some good features and even had some moments on his previous two albums that had released in Funeral and The Carter Five. So I was, I was excited. I was not necessarily expecting a high degree of quality here from front to back, but I was definitely expecting some high points. And I definitely got those because starting off, this album was really strong particularly the B.B. King freestyle, which was terrific. Drake's feature here was incredible. He fit perfectly and did his usual subtle flexes and life reflections over a nice melancholy beat, something that he's mastered at this point. But then Wayne came in and just murked that shit, just completely murked that shit. It was a great track. Then on Lamar, which was... To be clear, a foul, foul title for a song because it has a hook that's saying, I spit the ROC, nothing but crack, bitch. And for those that don't know, Lamar as the title is presumably a reference to Lamar Odom, the LA Laker who previously had an addiction to crack. So that's that's kind of that's kind of foul. But Wayne kills this song and shows that his flow maybe isn't what it once was in his prime as it's still very clumsy 
and slurred than what he delivered in his prime, which was much more clear. But still, there's a really nice energy and charisma in his flow that has been pretty gone for the past decade. He drops some great bars here and makes nice references to the source material, which is of the original Jay-Z track produced by Kanye, Takeover, from 2001's Blueprint. He has this really cool line where he says, You ain't running shit, boy. Feed your Ezekiel. Which is a reference to the Dallas Cowboys running back, Ezekiel Elliott, who's associated with the regular sports commentator's uh, slogan with him, which is Feed Zeke, a.k.a. giving the star running back the ball in football. And that's, that's another thing. Wayne has always had great football bars. This guy really knows his sports, and he, he shows that time and time again. The track Life is Good uh, is also a pretty cool track. His flow is pretty nice. Uh, but he had a questionable line about his Trump support, which I didn't really understand. I thought it was kind of whack, to be honest. He famously took a photo with Trump and said, oh, I support him right before this recent election, which is just super, super stupid. But slowly after we left the first few tracks of this album, we start to get some auto-tune singing, which is something Wayne has done in the past that I've really never liked. I really didn't work on track four here, and on deep end, it was just not good at all. It was at the midway point of this album, or this mixtape, sorry, where the subject matter became clear that it was just going to be about some braggadocious bars, nothing all that substantial, but that was never really Wayne's game anyway, so there's no problem with that. But for that to work, you, you have to bring the A game when it comes to delivery, charisma, personality, quality of the bars, etc. And I don't think he did that. In terms of the features, there's a lot of Young Money OGs here, like Gutta Gutta, uh, Corey Guns, and not Corey Guns, because he's not that bad, he's actually pretty good at times, but for the rest of them, it just reminded me of just how completely garbage these guys were. Gutta Gutta never recovered from that Bedrock verse, I never could respect his music, it's just, it's so whack. And it was at the midway point where we started to get these pretty... Uh, suspect features and it was also at the midpoint where this album just fell off a cliff Come des Garçons was a nice uh, a nice highlight in the back half of this album he has a nice I'm going nuts I'm dropping almond milk line shout out to my vegan listeners out there although I'm team soy milk to be honest but it was really after this where the album just was off a cliff it fell into the ocean as I mentioned, the features start to pop up in the back half of the album that aren't very good. But I need to mention the elephant in the room when it comes to the features, which is that Wayne allowed not one, not two, but three of his sons to rap on this mixtape. What the hell? Like, okay, fine. Lil Toon has a track here, has a verse. It's garbage, but whatever. You know what? Whatever. That's fine. It's just one track, he's putting on his son on a track. That's kind of cute, maybe. But then as the tape progresses, uh, we get to the track Hollywood. And then I'm like, wait, this is his son rapping again. He gave Lil Toon two verses. But then I realized, no, this is another one of his sons. And I'm like, what the hell is going on now? I don't want to listen to more than one verse from a child. And it doesn't end there, because then we get to the track Cam, which features Lil Wayne's third child, young Cam Carter. And at this point, I, I honestly, I started laughing at this point. I was, I was working out when I first heard this mixtape, and the Cam Carter track particularly really got to me, because he's rapping in the sicko mode flow over a sicko mode-like beat, that just sounded so funny. Like, I just couldn't believe what I was listening to. I really can't believe all three of his sons have verses on this thing. But then we get to the production of this tape, which really made me scratch my head. I don't know why he chose to rap over these beats. 
most of the beats after the first quarter of this album are just so mundane and generic. And it's a real shame because this is a mixtape series and is in line with Wayne's previous tapes where he famously rapped over the most poppin' beats in the game at that point. It was so nice to see him rap over a little brother beat in the past, or just in general beats that sometimes maybe didn't fit his usual southern rap sound, but here he just raps over generic trap beats that were all over his previous couple albums anyways. Especially that you're Lil Wayne, but even past that, this is a mixtape, it's completely normal to rap over anything you like, and you pick these beats to rap over? It just doesn't really make any sense. Finally, although it's not the biggest deal, DJ Drama, who was one of the main people to host Lil Wayne's mixtapes and host a lot of other people's mixtapes in the past, he had such a charisma that, although some people may not like it, it made the mixtape although completely all over the place, sound like it all made sense together, like he was a real true DJ giving you a playlist of absolute fire bangers, and it just came off really nice. DJ Khaled doesn't give me that, he just comes off corny like he always does, saying another one, another one. So every time I heard him, I was just tuning out, I really didn't like his ad-libs, uh, and really lacked the fire and fun that DJ Drama would bring. So after digesting this album, after hearing DJ Khaled mention on this mixtape that I Am Not A Human Being 3 by Lil Wayne, a real studio album would be coming out shortly, am I looking forward to it? I would say that no, I am not. I don't really care. I'll obviously check it out, but I also don't care if it never came out either. This mixtape has some dope moments for sure, but they were all front loaded at the beginning of this tape, making the last honestly three quarters of this mixtape an incredible chore to get through. By the end of the first listen, I was already not wanting to go to it again, but I take my job as this podcast host seriously and I know I have to listen to this mixtape multiple times but overall I didn't get anything from this I really thought based on the start of this tape it was really gonna be something like a renaissance for a little way maybe he was really turning a corner but he absolutely did not I give No Ceilings 3 by Lil Wayne a 5.5 on 10 if you're a fan of Lil Wayne, check it out. There's definitely some good moments here. But outside of that, this is just a really long mixtape that does nothing. Really doesn't offer much in terms of catchy hooks, good production, or anything in between. Now, finally, I'm going to move to the first installment of the new Indie Spotlight series that we're going to do here on the Rap Music Plug podcast. We have today No One's Tripping Project. So that's K-N-O-1, all one word. But before getting into this project, if you're an artist who wants to get their music reviewed on the show, feel free to DM me at Rovew, R-O-H-V-I-E-W, on Twitter or Instagram or shoot me an email at qlctv.podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear any new songs or albums that you have in store, and I'd love to review it on the show, but also if you just want to get my opinion on things and you don't want it public either, I'm definitely down to give you some feedback privately so that you can further improve your craft. I would love to be a part in helping you grow. So now onto the review of No One's Tripping. No One is a rapper from Maryland in the United States who has been rapping for a while, but had seemingly taken a long break since his last project 2014 to, I'm assuming, hone his craft and reintroduce himself to listeners with this new project called Tripping. The beats here are handled by a slew of different producers. There are some very notable names here where no one hopped over 
one of their beats, uh, most notably Jay Dilla, Will Sessions, uh, YU as well. And then there's some other producers that I'm not familiar with that I would assume actually produce specifically for this project. As a whole, the key takeaway from Tripping by No One is consistency and strong fundamentals. Right off the bat, it's clear that No One has a knack for finding the pocket in these jazzy mid-tempo beats. His rhyme schemes are solid, with a technically sound flow that makes me head nod throughout this whole thing. And from a subject matter perspective, No One presents himself as an everyman kind of rapper, with a penchant to, to get introspective and insightful through life observations on where he is currently and where he wants to be in the future. So if you're into artists like J. Cole or Big Crit, I think No One is right up your alley. No One's style fits snugly over these sample-heavy sulfur productions, particularly on songs like 124 Seasons, that's dope as hell, and sees No One drop some jewels with a very great, confident flow. Very much due to the production, this album maintains an impressive level of cohesion, which is pretty surprising to me because, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different producers and a lot of these beats weren't intended necessarily for this project originally. But this strong cohesion is found in really dope transitions between songs, particularly between Let Go with its beautiful horns that seamlessly flows right into the next track, 124 Seasons. Just really nice, really nice high point on this album. And I also liked the cool warped sample from Alicia Keys's No One song where they just took the hook and warped it a bit. And it, it sounds really nice and it's cool that it's sprinkled in a few times on this album, which just gives it a nice touch. The project starts strong with Heavy, with a catchy chorus where he trades bars with a rapper with this nice southern accent. Uh, you know, without the features listed on this track listing, I'm not able to tell you who this is, unfortunately. But it works really nicely. It's a really groovy, head nodding track with one of the best hooks on the album. And it stays strong until the last few tracks, in my opinion, with Wanted and Rando where I feel the guest features kind of took away from the momentum that the album was building upon until that point. On the track Wanted, I just find the hook is too light and breezy for an already smooth track. I didn't think the vocal stood out at all, and then on Rando, uh, the other feature here doesn't do much for me. I feel like he gets overshadowed by a much more impressive performance from no one that finishes the track. That being said, the project finishes with a very strong closing track and my favorite track on the whole project. The beat produced by Will Sessions is using this Velvet Underground Venus and Fur sample that was super dope, super dope. And I appreciate this sample work particularly because my bum ass remembers trying to make a beat using my MPC with this very same sample earlier this summer and failing miserably. I also like the crisp percussion here as well. And no one saves his best performance for last here. More confident and urgent delivery than any other moment on this album, with some really nice imagery in the lyrics. And the feature rapper here as well did a really dope job. All in all, this project is really smooth, with solid rapping and lyrical content that has substance and puts me just in an overall good headspace. I think where no one has room to grow is found precisely in the fact that he is a very capable rapper who has substance in his bars. So I think he could benefit from taking this to another level with more storytelling oriented tracks that provide more detail into his thoughts and his emotions uh, that would further flex this already strong skill of his. And although I did like the production throughout this project, I do think that no one would benefit more from rapping over more busy and off-kilter production. 
it's similar to how I felt about Boldy James because both of these guys have very steady and consistent flows. And this is why, although I did really like Price of Tea in China, I thought Boldy's Sterling Tolls collaboration and Manger on McNichols was just so much better because Boldy's steady flow contrasted so nicely with the beautifully ever-evolving psychedelic jazz instrumentals that Sterling Tolls laced him with. And finally, just a bit more attention to the hooks or maybe just collaborating with other artists who bring a different energy to some of these songs could make the music just a bit more dynamic, which I think would serve no one quite well. But overall, as a first project that I am reviewing in this series, I am really pleased that this was such a good one. I'm really excited to see where no one goes from here. And as far as introductions go, this was a really strong one. So you guys should check this out. So this concludes today's episode of the Rap Music Plug podcast presented by QLC TV. I hope this helped you understand what music to check out or stay away from. And now that I've spoken, it's your turn to make your voice heard. So let's keep in touch. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Rowview, R-O-H-V-I-E-W, to connect with me on a personal level, where you'll be able to interact with my thoughts and perspectives on music, surely, but also on politics and sports as well. If you're an artist who wants to get their new song or album reviewed on the show, hit me up via email at qlctv.podcast at gmail.com, or just send me a DM on Twitter or Instagram. I would love to give you public feedback through a review or private feedback if that's what you'd prefer. I would love to be a part of helping you grow as an artist. For exclusive content and updates related to the show, follow the Rap Music Plug podcast on Facebook. And lastly, I've started a TikTok. Uh, But don't worry, there will be no dancing, I assure you. Instead, I intend to give you some fun bite-sized micro-album and song reviews, as well as some other miscellaneous perspectives on music as well. You can find me by searching the Rap Music Plug on TikTok. You can find all of this information along with exclusive playlists created by myself by clicking the link that's in the episode's notes. So that's all for today. Talk to you soon. Peace. Peace.